Peabody Award winner for public service produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Argo, Illinois, only 15 miles from Chicago's loop, is more for commuters. Argo's churches, well up to date schools and recreational facilities, are supported by money generated within the town itself. For Argo, unlike many big city suburbs, offers steady employment inside its own boundaries to most of its residents. Here they turn out some 500 products in a complex factory rated among the largest food processing plants in the world. And nearly all the 500 products are made of corn. Each year, our corn fields, including the specially fertile ones not far from this plant, produce more wealth than the nation's mining industry. And corn, after it's treated in dozens of ways under careful controls, constitutes a larger part of our diet than any other single crop. That statistic includes the corn consumed directly as table products and indirectly in the form of meat, milk, and eggs. At this particular point in Corn Products Refining Company's Argo plant, one of many it operates in various parts of the world, we see oils being extracted from the grain. Corn oil, of course, is one of the most widely used of all vegetable fats, with dozens of applications in the kitchen. Syrup for those breakfast pancakes, another of the popular applications for the corn which produces so much of America's agricultural income and which is the foundation for a major processing industry. Of the 3,000 who work here in the plant, 100 have from 40 to 50 years of continuous service. Nearly 1,000 have worked for the firm from 25 to 35 years. Many of the corn products they turned out years ago are still popular today. Others are new, and so is the fast, efficient machinery now used throughout the plant to hold down production costs while permitting workers to move up to more attractive, better paying jobs involving skilled maintenance, inspection, and research. To help train its workers for these better jobs, and also for more active community life, the company is a leader in industry-sponsored adult education. It practices a continuous program of employing graduates of local technical and business schools, and provides the major support for Argo High School's night courses. In Argo, the men who control equipment like this starch machine are likely to be found during their leisure hours taking an active role in their community's educational, religious, and recreational programs. Of the products they manufacture, dry, instant starch is among the 20 or so packaged for home consumption. At the same moment one section of the plant is packing starch for home laundries, Others are busy not only with various consumer lines, but also with some 450 different items made of corn for industrial and agricultural uses. Cyrillose is an industrial dextrose sugar used by bakers and confectioners. Another product from the crop that plays a major role at so many stages of our expanding economy. For generations from the four corners of the world, people came to America to live under a way of life that gave them the spiritual satisfactions which could be realized only under personal freedom. Here they found religious freedom where they could worship in a church of their choice, political freedom where they could cast their ballots for a candidate of their choice, academic freedom which has meant better education for all, and finally, economic freedom, a private competitive enterprise system which has enabled all of us to attain the highest standard of living known to man. Here's a scene as old as the family, a father presenting his daughters with a brand new batch of dolls, possibly the most perennial of all children's playthings. But there's a difference here, a difference that has made new techniques suddenly popular in a very old industry. A big part of the difference is in the catalog. Pictures show how each doll's wardrobe can be kept up with current fashion. 
A company called Vogue Dolls Incorporated has been thriving since founder Jenny Graves decided doll accessories can be as fascinating to little girls as the dolls themselves. Mrs. Graves, here on the left, believed dolls should be small enough for children to handle, should be more lifelike, and should be easy for children to dress in clothing like that the children wear themselves. At first, Mrs. Graves made the clothing herself in her own kitchen. Now the demand is so great she employs hundreds in the operation, utilizing two factories in Malden and Medford, Massachusetts. One woman's love for sewing, her need to support her family, and her conviction that she had a worthwhile idea, all combined to produce a multi-million dollar business and enough dolls to provide one for every fourth little girl in the United States. The Ginny doll, as it's called, is just eight inches tall, a size not much favored a few years ago. It has lifelike features, moving eyes, head, legs, and arms, and a sales record that proves Mrs. Graves was as right about the size and construction as she was about the accessories. Now an even smaller doll is proving just as popular. Ginny's baby sister, Jeanette, also has a complete and suitable wardrobe that's as changeable as a little girl's mood on a rainy day. For each doll, there are 75 different outfits redesigned each year. And there's a new trend throughout the industry as a result. Once highly seasonal, the market now is extending through the year as Ginny and dolls like her create lasting demand from tots whose toy families just never seem to have a thing to wear. With the wardrobes, there are trunks and even a complete playground. And with these new developments, there are new companies formed to help satisfy the demand, creating new jobs for thousands, as well as new pleasures for the little girls Mrs. Graves had in mind all along. An artist completes his conception of a new sign electronically equipped to provide continuous answers to two of life's most constant questions. What time is it and what's the temperature? Every five seconds, the sign will calculate the latest information and flash it to the public by way of bulbs and neon tubing. Designed to harmonize with the building or institution that displays it, this advertising sign posts the time and temperature alternately. The proper designation is spelled out in the tubing being shaped here at the American Sign and Indicator Corporation factory in Spokane, Washington. Incidentally, only red is likely to be really neon, for that's the natural color of glowing neon gas. Other colors in electric signs are produced by other gases or colored tubing. While the words time and temperature will be spelled out in tubing, the numerals will be formed by panels of bulbs, lighting up in various combinations as selected by the electronic panel that goes with each sign. The time control mechanism is governed by a synchronous motor, automatically corrected every 60 seconds. Here's how time and temperature alternate every five seconds. The temperature is measured by an apparatus on the roof of the building, protected from wind and sun and transmitted to the display through 100 wire connections. Here, a man grasps the unit in his hand to show how the heat of his body will change the reading. Each sign uses 340 bulbs. Showmanship is combined with electronics to gather accurate information on time and temperature and display it for all to see on some of the busiest crossroads of America. Through the years, Americans have learned that machines create jobs. We know that machines have shortened hours, raised wages, and made it possible to manufacture the things we need for our standard of living at prices that people can afford to pay. Machines call for greater specialization. That gives workers a chance to use more mind and less muscle and to develop new skills. In short, 
It makes them masters of the machine. Operators, inspectors, and supervisors. In Fort Worth, Texas, a helicopter is about to get an interior decoration job as comfortable and as colorful as those in the most luxurious automobiles. The man who wants custom fittings in his new copter has it delivered to Horton & Horton, where specialists measure the ship as carefully as a tailor measures a man for a new suit of clothes. With doors removed to give plenty of working space, the helicopter first gets a thick sheet of sound-absorbing insulation. Inside the plant, which is conveniently located on an airfield so clients may taxi right to the door, upholstery material is cut to fit the bulkhead panel that will close off the rear of the pilot and passenger compartment. Horton & Horton, named for the firm's founding husband and wife team, decorates the interiors of all kinds of aircraft. Some are new. Some are older ones converted to the requirements of businesses, which today operate some 20,000 flying machines to carry their executives, salesmen, and engineers. As air transportation has grown in recent years, so have many companies like this one, formed to help make flying increasingly comfortable. Genuine cowhide will be used to cover the seat in that helicopter we saw a moment ago. Painstakingly cut to just the right shape and fitted to the custom foam rubber cushions inside the plant, the seat is quickly installed in the space so carefully measured earlier. Nearly finished now, the new interior gets a final touch, an ashtray and colors to fit the decor. Then a final inspection by Mrs. Dorothy Horton, whose feminine judgment in decoration is an important part of each job. Transformed into a combination office and living room of the air, the helicopter is ready to carry pilot and passenger in comfort wherever their business takes them. As more and more Americans spend more and more time in the air, industry devotes more and more time and attention to making the machine seem just like home. 